Good morning, everyone. Uh, we're just going to let uh, the rest of the participants join in and then we'll go ahead and get started. Good morning, everyone. Uh, we're just going to let uh, the rest of the participants join in and then. Okay, well, welcome everyone. Silverado Policy Accelerator is thrilled to have you here with us this morning for our event on 2022 Export Enforcement Priorities. We are very lucky to have with us newly confirmed Assistant Secretary for Export Enforcement, Matt Axelrod. Welcome, Matt. Thanks, Sarah. First and foremost, congratulations on your appointment. We're going to dig in a little bit more on your background, but I'd like to thank you upfront for many years of dedicated public service. You served for 13 years at the Department of Justice on a range of criminal and national security matters before bringing that wealth of expertise to the Department of Commerce. With export controls and enforcement bubbling up as one of the key ways to address today's growing national security and foreign policy threats, you could be running for the hills, but instead, that could not be farther from the truth as you are already hard at work and even in a position today to announce some new compliance initiatives that will impact industry. So to our viewers, if you were thinking about jumping off early, you may wanna stay put. Just a quick note about the Silverado Policy Accelerator. We celebrated our first anniversary just yesterday and very proud of all that we've accomplished in the past year. Our mission is to forge a path towards prosperity and global competitiveness for the United States and its allies through investment in bipartisan, economic, strategic, and technological policy solutions. At this pivotal moment of geopolitical competition, Silverado is working to advance the best solutions to critical policy challenges, and then incubate and accelerate those ideas into concrete results. Today's event, falls squarely in our ambit, and we look forward to the discussion. Please use the Q&A function to submit questions and we'll make sure to reserve a few minutes at the end. So let's jump in. Matt, you have a distinguished career as a lawyer, from private practice to White House counsel to over 13 years at DOJ, where you served in a range of key leadership roles, including most recently as Associate Deputy Attorney General. You've prosecuted high profile cases, including convicting two founders of the Cali cartel. Now you are helming the Export Enforcement Office within the Bureau of Industry and Security at the Department of Commerce. Tell us more about how your career path led you here. Yeah, thank, thanks, Sarah. And thank you to Silverado for putting together this event today. Um, you know, I'm really lucky to have the opportunity to serve uh, again, um, it's been uh, six years, I think, since there was a Senate confirmed person in my position. Um, and uh, so as well, I'm giving out thank yous, have to give a thank you to President Biden for nominating me to Secretary Raimondo for supporting that nomination and for the United States Senate for confirming me. Um, you know, it's great. It's great to be here. I, I would say that the through line for me um, has been a commitment to public service and particularly um, to doing work with federal law enforcement and national security. And that, that's why I'm so excited to be here at the Bureau of Industry and Security um, doing export enforcement. You know, a, a decade ago, I will confess, um, I, I didn't know a lot. And I think the sort of American people didn't know a lot about BIS and, and what we do, but our, our profile has sort of changed um, in the past 10 years, I think actions um, taken against CTE uh, and then in the last administration against Huawei and, um, you know, uh, um, and, and now we're sort of in the in the news in a, in a, in a daily basis for un unfortunate reasons. But for, you know, talk about um, what export controls are going to be brought to bear um, against Russia. Um, so, you know, you combine the sort of rising profile with the, you know, rising sort of threats from nation state actors. Um, you know, we at BIS, along with, with others in the U.S. government, are really, you know, the tips of one of the spears working to prevent um, countries like uh, China, Russia, and Iran from obtaining sensitive U.S. technology 
that they then can use for malign purposes like WMD proliferation and military modernization and human rights abuses? Well, it, you wouldn't know it, but your career path have really does actually dovetail. And so the Department of Commerce is lucky to, to have you bringing that experience on. And I couldn't agree with you more. I've been a trade lawyer for uh, the past several decades and never before in the last you know, few years have our export control laws and, and enforcement been so front and center. Um, you know, obviously, in the last few weeks, we've seen um, increasing aggression by Russia against Ukraine and, and, and most recently actual invasion. Um, so it's, it's evident that our threats continue to evolve. I wonder, you know, you've touched on a little bit of this already, but can you talk about the nature of the national security threats that, you know, your office is going to be working to combat in your new role? Yeah, sure. And un unfortunately, you know, and today of all days, it's, uh, it's all too clear the rising nation state threats that our country faces. You know, if you think about the last 20 years, um, the threats to our national security have um, been largely non-state actors, right? If you think about Al-Qaeda and ISIS, um, but where we are now um, today, and not just today, right, where we've been for a little while is really um, a rise of uh, threats from state actors. You know, President Biden, just, just a year ago at the Munich Security Conference, right, there was one last week, but there was also one a, a year ago, and President Biden at that conference talked about the competition between democracy and autocracy, right, and how in the United States, as a leader of democracy, we believe in the international rules-based order. We have freedom of speech. We have freedom of religion. People are free to do what they want for work, all right? The laws here, we have a rule of law where the laws apply not just to the people, but also to the government. And, and that's in opposition to, to regimes like those in China and Russia and Iran that reject those democratic values. And you have political leaders who bully and repress their neighbors and their own people. And today, you know, Russia, you know, further than that, right, unprovoked and, and uh, an unjustified war of choice against, against the people of Ukraine, um, right? Those, those governments, the autocratic governments use propaganda and censorship to stymie expression uh, and freedom of expression and wage disinformation and mass surveillance campaigns. They subvert the rules-based order through cyber attacks and massive IP and technology theft. Um, WMD proliferation, and to maintain their grip on power, and this is sort of where we come into the picture, um, they're intently focused on building their military capabilities, both conventional military capabilities and nuclear capabilities, and the rapid pace of technological advancement, right, that we see and benefits us in our personal lives, or sometimes doesn't benefit, right, depending on your perspective, right, it also, there, there, there's technology advancement, um, things like hypersonics, Right, like the the the, the rapid um, technological change when it comes to hypersonics can lead to potentially right missile systems that are able to evade existing uh, detection, which you know obviously has huge consequences for the strategic deterrence system, right? Or quantum, right? Quantum computing advances in quantum computing could eventually, people believe, could eventually lead to both the ability to make unbreakable encryption and the ability to break all existing encryption. And whoever sort of wins that technology race, right, is gonna have a real sort of leg up strategically and militarily. Well, there's no shortage of, of work to be done. Um, and uh, almost a, an alarming amount of, of threats. So you have within BIS, two offices. You have the Export Enforcement Office and the Export Administration Office. And together, you work to counter the threats that you've just talked about to enable legitimate global trade um, and in goods and, and technology and to keep those goods and technology out of the ha hands of our adversaries. But this is a huge mandate, as we've just heard. The amount of threats that you're trying to combat are huge. Can you walk through a little bit of how the office works and what are the key challenges that you see in your office? Yeah, sure. So our primary mission is to make sure that sensitive U.S. technology um, isn't used by governments like China, Russia, and Iran for malign 
purposes, right? That they don't get that technological leg up that they're trying to get by um, using US technology to get there. And in particular, we at the Bureau of Industry and Security are responsible for what are called dual use goods, goods that are capable of um, civilian use, but also capable of military use. And, and that's one of the things right off the bat that's a challenge because that's complicated, right? Like, so I have a, I have a prop, right? So this is a, a graphics processing unit. Well, it's actually an assembly that has a bunch of chips on them that are GPUs. Um, and what, what these chips do is they process many pieces of data simultaneously to accelerate the creation and processing of images, right? So that's terrific when it's in your kid's Xbox, right? It makes the video game like really lifelike. Um, but it's not great when it's used to build surveillance, artificial intelligence surveillance tools that the Chinese government used to um, repress the Uyghurs, right? And uh, in a in, as part of the genocide that's led to the death of more than a, a, a million people in that country. And so our challenge is, it's the same GPU. How do we ensure that the GPUs that are being used for the Xbox are are okay for American industry to ship, but the GPUs that are being used to repress the Uyghurs aren't. So that that's a real challenge, and we we come at it a couple of you know a couple of different ways. We have the as you said, there are two sides to our house. There the, there's the export administration side, um, which is run by my colleague Taya Kendler, um, and they're the ones who set the rules, tell industry what's okay to go where, and then they license. Um, they run the licensing process so that people can. U.S. exporters can get licenses. We 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 come in on the on more on the back end. I run the enforcement side, right? And one of our you asked our challenges. One of our challenges uh, is that we're we're a bit outnumbered, right? Last year um, there were 32 million dual use exports out of the United States. We have 400 people total in BIS. Um, on my side, the enforcement side, there are 170 of us, and so. That's that's a real challenge. We have to be very strategic about how we how we do our work. We use um, not just sort of intelligence, but sort of all source um, uh, uh, data to target um, how we do what we do. We have some new undercover authorities we use, but that's that's a challenge um, mm -hmm. for for us and for our for our for our enforcement. Um, um, we another challenge is. Um, uh, multilateral controls versus unilateral controls. What I mean by that is if, if we as um, the Bureau of Industry and Security put in export controls that restrict US industry from sending certain goods to certain places, but we do that alone and none of our allies who also manufacture the same goods put similar controls in place, then the people we're trying to prevent from getting the sensitive technology can still get it they're just getting it from companies that aren't based in the US. So all we've done is hurt US industry and we haven't stopped the sensitive technology from getting to the place we don't want it to go. So we have to work hard for to make sure our controls are multilateral where possible. But there are also some instances, you know, like when um, items are being used for human rights abuses where it's just the, the um, it's so, so important that we, we do impose unilateral controls. And, and I guess I, I would say the, the, the third, um, or fourth challenge I would I would point to is that our adversaries are really sophisticated. You know, the FBI director, Chris Ray, gave a speech a couple of weeks ago at the Reagan Library about the, you know, just how um, pressing and persistent the threat from the Chinese government is, um, you know, the use of front companies and how they're stealing sensitive U.S. technology for, um, through cyber hacks, how they use subsidiaries and shells to try to evade the export controls we put on them. Um, you know that's a that's a that's a challenge for us too, and I, I would say the despite all these challenges, um, we uh, have been doing really well. We partner with um, other federal law enforcement agencies to sort of build our uh, capacity. And um, since the start of this administration of the Biden administration, we've had again with our partners um, 51 criminal convictions, um, 44 administrative denial orders, which means that people are no longer allowed to export uh, items overseas. Um, we've had 22 administrative settlements. And then if you go back 10 years, that, the decade I was talking about, um, again, with our partners, there's been a total of $3.6 billion in criminal and administrative penalties related to export enforcement.
Wow, that those do seem like big challenges, but I think that you know you're you're up to the task. <laughs> Um, I wanted to I wanted to flesh out one of the one of the challenges that you raised, and I think that this is an important piece when we talk about multilateral controls versus unilateral controls. Um, is there something in between? Is there some you know go it with a small group of countries? Um, and how does the U.S. think about working with with countries uh, when it when it comes to that sort of short of going to, for example, the Vassanar Agreement? Yeah, there is something in the middle uh, called plurilateral controls, right? It's not um, sort of everyone, but it's a it's a smaller it's a smaller group. And yeah, we 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 um, uh, and it's more on my. Um, my colleague Taya Kendler's side of the house, who's she's the Assistant Secretary for Export Administration, but um, we work really hard to with our counterparts around the world to sort of build support for plurilateral or multilateral controls, depending on the on the issue. And um, Taya and other colleagues from the interagency were uh, in Europe. Um, I think it was two weeks ago. Not surprisingly, to you know build build support for sort of the export controls um, that uh, um, I uh, are, are not have, have not yet been announced, but uh, I believe the president will be speaking later today. And so folks should stay tuned. But you know, that that type of um, sort of diplomacy and working with allies um, and like minded countries in order to make sure that um, we're coming at problems from a, um, a position of a, where we can present a unified front is obviously very important. Absolutely, especially considering some of the threats that, that we've discussed, including human rights. Um, as you're settling into your new role, Matt, um, you know, you obviously, you've got a number of threats coming at you, some new, some old. You have a number of challenges, but uh, you also have a positive agenda. And I, would, I wanted you to talk a little bit about what are the key priorities that you are going to be focusing on in the coming months or year? Yeah, so thanks, Sarah. I, I, I've been talking um, internally about them as um, sort of the three Ps. Uh, so the first um, has to do with profile um, and sort of right, continuing to raise the, the profile of, of the work that, that folks here do, not just because they're um, incredibly talented and dedicated um, uh, uh, government servants, but also because it, I, I think it has important programmatic effects, right? I, I want um, companies to know uh, that, and most do, by the way, but I want to continue to get the word out that um, uh, about what we do and the, and the reason it's important and so that companies will um, invest in their compliance systems, right? Like I, I, I believe that um, our work can have a powerful deterrent effect, which is, you know, we obviously we'd, we'd rather we prefer that the goods and the technologies not go um, on the on the front end, rather than us having to enforce and convict people on, on the back end. Um, I, I feel like the the work of um, export enforcement that we've been a little bit of like the secret weapon of national security, and I'd like us to be not quite so secret. I think you know world events are um, about to make us not not quite so secret. Uh, that wasn't quite um, how I would have. You know, prefer preferred to raise our profile, but um, so that's that's one. And um, the second is to strengthen our partnerships. So that's the second P is partnerships, um, uh, both with uh, industry um, and ac academia, um, but not just industry and academia. Also with our you know foreign law, law enforcement counterparts for some of the reasons we were just talking about um, with the intelligence community who we work closely with with um, with and with federal law enforcement. Uh, we rely, you know, there are only 170 of us on the export enforcement side. We, we, we rely really heavily on our partnerships with FBI and HSI and CBP and ATF in order to, to force, force multiply. I'll give you one example of that, that partnership. You know, in 2018, there was an investigation by FBI and HSI into the export of firearms parts and manufacturing tools to Iraq. And, and we joined that investigation um, because we had uh, export tools and charges that could be brought. And so as a result of our being brought in and partnering with FBI and H HSI, we're able to 
bring charges against an individual in the Middle District of Pennsylvania in 2018. But because of those charges, FBI and HSI were able to continue to develop the case. And last week, that case was superseded to add torture allegations against that individual. It's only the second time ever that a US citizen has been um, accused of um, torture. And at least my understanding, that's the FBI HSI part of the case, but that our involvement you know, helped allow the case to continue to progress and to get to that point where um, FBI and HSI working with DOJ were able to bring, you know, again, only the, the second torture case ever against a US citizen. Um, the third, the third um, priority is um, uh, perhaps the most important, which is to prioritize our enforcement. That's, that's how I get the P, prioritize our enforcement. Look, it, um, as we've been discussing, we're, we're a small but mighty crew over here. We have to make sure that our resources are matched against the most pressing national security threats. And for us, um, that's uh, uh, first and foremost, China. Um, as I said, FBI Director Ray, I think, laid it out pretty convincingly a couple of weeks ago about how the Chinese government is only getting more brazen and their actions are more damaging. Um, you know, since uh, uh, President Biden took office, we, we've had 18 criminal and administrative actions um, involving uh, exports to China, including um, a 42-month uh, prison sentence for someone who was sending uh, raiding craft. Um, so. Um, you know, the types of, of, of things that our special US special forces use, right. um, raiding craft with specific types of engines to China for the, for the express purpose of them being reverse engineered and mass produced to the PLA. Um, and also, uh, since uh, the start of the Biden administration, we've added 81 Chinese companies to the entity list, which is uh, essentially a, a, a blacklist. Um, and uh, there are now a total of 500 Chinese and entities on the entity list in, in April. We added seven Chinese supercomputing companies. Um, and those are companies that um, sort of um, develop um, the technology that uh, linked to the hypersonics uh, I was talking about earlier. And in November, we put three military quantum companies um, on, the, on, the, on the entity list as well. Um, and then the last thing on China is that uh, just a couple of weeks ago, we announced that we were putting 33 Chinese companies on the unverified list. Um, the unverified list is um, a red flag list, which requires additional due diligence from, from the US. And that was because uh, the Chinese government wasn't allowing us to do the end use checks we need, we need to do. And once we're able to do those end use checks, we can those, those companies can come off the unverified list. The, the other thing um, uh, when we talk about prioritized enforcement is obviously <laughs> Russia. And as I said, I don't want to get ahead of the, you know, the president's announcement later today, but he's, he's um, made very clear that there will be severe sanctions. And I'll make very clear here, uh, not that there should have been any doubt, that we will enforce uh, those severe sanctions uh, aggressively. Um, since the start of the administration, we've had 14 criminal administrative cases involving Russia, um, uh, I guess the most recent in, in September, we had a penalty of 500, nearly $500,000 on a company called Virago Technologies that were setting up a shell company in Bulgaria to sell radiation hardened chips with defense applications to, to Russia. And uh, three defendants were previously indicted there and we're still awaiting um, their, uh, hopefully be able to extra, extradite them. So those are the three, uh, partnerships, profile partnerships and uh, prioritized enforcement. Well, you, you, you definitely have your work cut out for you, for you, Matt. Um, and we'll look forward to, to hearing from the president later today um, on Russia. I wanted to follow up with you on, on a couple of things that I think are areas that are in the news quite a bit lately, but that are harder to understand. And so maybe it'd be a good opportunity for you to talk to the audience about it. You talked about the unverified list and, and this concept of end use checks. Can you elaborate a little bit more on what you mean by that? Um, what we, my understanding is that China has not allowed end use checks without government notice and approval, which would undermine the effort conceivably about, uh, you know, conducting the end use check in the first place. And Russia doesn't allow them at all. Is that your understanding as well? And what, what more can be done? Yeah, so um, on end use, so first let me so sorry, I say what end use checks are, which are, we, they can be both 
sort of pre-license before a company gets a license to ship something overseas. We we have um, people uh, in my shop that that are stationed overseas. We have nine people that are called export control officers, and they're stationed in Europe and the Middle East and in Asia. Um, and they're uh, we don't obviously don't have the resources to check every <laughs> every shipment, but when we have reasons to to do to do the end use checks, and sometimes they're random, um, we. Uh, We'll have one of our people arrange to go and check to make sure that the place um, where the good or technology is supposedly being shipped to is actually the place that, <laughs> that is receiving it and that the purpose uh, it is, uh, folks said it was going to be used for is the actual purpose it's being used for. So, you know, I'll give you one example from recently. We, we had one where um, supposedly night vision cameras um, were being shipped to a Hong Kong um, with the idea that they were um, uh, going eventually to a, a NATO country in Europe. Um, and when we did an end use check in Hong Kong, the um, company in Hong Kong had no knowledge of the transaction and the supposed employee who signed the end use certification didn't actually work there, right? And so based on our sort of um, understanding of what's happened in the past, like we believe that that shipment was gonna get diverted into mainland China. Um, and that's why we do those those checks. Um, uh, it, it's true we don't we don't have anyone on the ground in, in Russia anymore. We we did we we don't any any anymore. Obviously, you know, as of after today's events, we wouldn't we wouldn't anyway. Um, in China, we 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 do have um, uh, two ECOs in in China, and we we do work with the the Chinese government to set up and and use checks. The, what happened. Um, uh, is that uh, we haven't been able to schedule um, them. The, the Chinese government has, uh, has, has not been uh, working with us the way they, they have been in the past, which is why for those 33 companies, um, they went on the unverified list. We can't do the end use check, then it's gonna require a, a higher degree of due diligence for people to export to those companies. We're, we're hopeful, I'm optimistic that we'll be able to sort it through with the, the Chinese government to be able to schedule those checks and then you know, assuming those checks check out, those companies would be able to come off the, the unverified list. Got it. And then one last question. On the entity list, um, you mentioned that under the Biden administration, you've added a number of Chinese companies to the entity list. How difficult of a process is, is, that? is that? Is that is that something that goes on for many months? How does a company get onto the list? Yeah, not many, not many months. There's an interagency process uh, between us and, and three other agencies for putting companies on the list. Um, and uh, it, 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 can, it can happen, you know, in, a, in fairly short order if, um, you know, if everyone's in, in alignment. The standard is if, uh, if, if there's um, reason to believe that a company is acting um, contrary to the national security or foreign policy um, interests of the, of the United States. Um, and so, um, and once a company is on a, on a, a, on the entity list, um, you know, uh, I, I referred to earlier as to a kind of blacklist. Um, it, it, it doesn't mean that um, uh, nothing ever can get exported to those companies. It's just that there um, there's a presumption of denial um, for a license. So that presumption can be overcome, and sometimes things do get licensed to get sent to companies on the entity list, but um, it's it's harder once you're on the entity list. Got it. Okay, thanks very much. I think it's important that as we're, you know, talking about all of these terms that the audience and, and the greater American public that is, is reading about all these actions really understands what we're talking about, so I appreciate that. So I wanted to take some time now. I know you've got a couple of new initiatives that you are about to un unveil and, uh, and to roll out. And so maybe now is a great time for you to talk a little bit about what's on deck and you know, what our industry colleagues should be thinking about. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Sarah. So as I said earlier, look, our goal is to, um, uh, is to spark deterrence, right? We we want we we don't have the resources to investigate, prosecute every every case, and even if we did, um, much better for um, the goods and technologies not to go places they're not supposed to go to begin with. Um, so we're looking for ways to sort of for, force multiply. Um, and there's sort of two things um, that I can announce today 
um, their reviews as opposed to actual, you know, hey, here's the changes we're making. Because you know, I've only been here, I think it's, this is week seven. Um, but I do want to sort of tell folks that we are doing these, these reviews. Um, and the first is we're reviewing how we can strengthen our administrative enforcement program. You know, I talked earlier about some of our criminal cases, but when cases don't go criminal, we, we still can enforce administratively here in-house at the Department of Commerce um, that can result in fines, um, as well as the denial of export privileges, which is a pretty significant thing to someone who's in the business of exporting. Um, we're taking a look at um, three things in particular related to our administrative enforcement program and how we can strengthen it. Um, the first is um, at how often we use no admit, no deny resolutions as mm -hmm. opposed to a resolution where there's um, an admission by the company to a statement of facts as to what actually occurred. Um, and the reason we're looking at that is, you know, in order for, again, to help deterrence for companies to be able to look at prior resolutions and see what, what actually happened in a statement of facts we think can be helpful. And also there's an accountability piece too, of course, if you know someone actually engaged in the conduct to um, admit to what that conduct is. So we're taking a look at that. Um, we're taking a look at whether our penalty amounts are properly calibrated to reflect the national security harm. Um, you know, our penalty amounts are uh, sort of tied to the value of the transaction, which, you know, sometimes, um, you know, can be an appropriate barometer, but sometimes not, right? The, it can be an inexpensive part that allows the missile to function. Um, that's, uh, you know, we, we got to, we're just thinking about that, whether how we make sure our penalties are, are calibrated to the right level. And then third, um, we're thinking about when and in what cases there should be parallel um, export enforcement administrative resolutions to accompany DOJ criminal resolutions. In other words, you know, sometimes well, our cases, as I said, can go either ad administrative or criminal. Sometimes when they go criminal, we stand down administratively and we're taking a look at, you know, does that make sense? When does it make sense to stand down administratively versus when does it make sense to, in addition to the criminal resolution, there also needs to be an administrative resolution with us. So those are sort of the three things that we're taking a look at in our review of how to strengthen our administrative enforcement program. Okay. Um, the, the second thing, the second sort of review we're doing is how our voluntary self-disclosure program works. The, the idea of a voluntary self-disclosure program is, you know, you um, at the company have um, uncovered something that happened that shouldn't have happened. And rather than wait for us to come knock on your door and ask you about it, you come and tell us about it. And obviously you get a big benefit as a company um, in how you get treated by us because you told us about it and that's what we want companies to do. Um, last year, we had 400 voluntary self-disclosures to, to us, um, but of those 400, only three um, had uh, some sort of administrative sanction as a result and, and none of them went, went criminal. Um, and look, that might be the right you know, the right proportion because many voluntary self-disclosures reflect just minor technical errors that companies tell us about. But, you know, but but some, a small subset reflect more serious deficiencies and, and require some additional follow-up and investigation. And so we're just thinking internally about how best to identify and focus our resources and attention on those that require the follow-up and also how best for you know companies that tell us about a minor technical violation, how we can streamline resolution for them and get that sort of quick answers quick quickly through our system so that we can sort of concentrate our resources on that handful that require the more the more involved um, follow up. And so we're taking a we're taking a look at that. So again, thank you for letting me sort of tell people that we are starting to review these things. Not it's not we haven't landed on how we're gonna. Um, do them. I don't have the, the actual policy to roll out, but I do think it's important for industry and for the bar to know that these are things we're taking a look at. And so, you know, the, the way things have operated in the, in the past aren't necessarily the way they're going to operate going, going forward um, as we conduct the reviews. 
Well, I think it's I think it's really important that um, there is a lot of transparency coming from the government to our industry colleagues on these types of issues. So I greatly appreciate your candor and I'm sure that you know our viewers also appreciate that because it's going to really impact how they're thinking about designing compliance systems and you know working internally. Do you have any advice for, for industry colleagues on you know, how to start thinking about these issues? What type of collaboration do you envision with the private sector here? Um, I'm sure that they are all ears. <laughs> Um, yeah, well, so on the on the I have some for the you know the specific initiatives and then some to sort of more more generally. Look, I mean we're we're we we happy and interested in in hearing from folks if people have views on on how uh, you know on 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 the stuff we just laid out about ways to strengthen our administrative enforcement program and um, and on voluntary self disclosures. Um, right, it, it, we're happy to have. Um, sort of uh, conversations with with industry industry groups about that, and one of the things I'm um, one of the reasons I'm glad to be able to do this with you is uh, I think it's the start of me um, doing more sort of um, both public speaking, but also you know interactions with sort of stakeholders, and always happy to to meet with folks and, and talk with folks. Um, there are some aside from that, I think some specific things that um, I, I guess uh, I would have. Uh, um, you know, tips for for industry um, who um, you know care, and I know um, people do about about these these issues. And one is to make sure that um, your company has an export and management compliance program. I, you know, big companies do, but smaller companies maybe sometimes don't or don't think that um, items that they're exporting would be the types of items that we would care about. But you know, truth be told, it's not always the you know highest end technology that that we care about we do care about that but we also care about you know the, the sort of the smaller component part that may even not have a specific export um, classification number but it's it's an important part um, because it's us made and it's reliable and you know people overseas want to put it in their you know in their weapon systems right that, that that's that's um, still really important to us um, and so we encourage everyone to have um, a robust compliance program. Um, you know, voluntary self-disclosures, like I said, we got 400 last year. We, we like getting voluntary self-disclosures. We, we think it's important. And um, as I said, it's always better to knock on our door before we knock on yours, no matter what changes, if any, we end up making to how we sort of think about or, or process our voluntary self-disclosures are always going to be benefit to, to coming in. And we encourage people to come in. Um, uh, I think people can look over their contract clauses, right? To uh, look over their contracts to make sure that there are clauses um, from parties overseas that you're dealing with to make sure that they're representing that they are in compliance with U.S. export laws. If you ask for such a clause and and your foreign partner isn't giving it to you, you know that seems like a red flag. Um, um, and then lastly, I would encourage folks to get to know their local office of export enforcement agent. We're in 30 cities around the country, um, and they, our agents don't just do investigations. They are there to educate industry, academia, about how the rules work, right? Um, some of what we do is, is, is complicated, and folks want to comply. They don't know how. They have questions. They should feel free to reach out to either their local agent or to us here at headquarters. We have, um, you know, we have... Uh, duty um, folks who answer questions all the time um, from from exporters. Um, so either you know you can call here to headquarters or really I encourage people to get to know their their local folks in their in their community as well. This is this is great advice. I hope everybody's been been taking some good notes. <laughs> um, so we're going to turn now to a couple of comments and, and questions before we wrap up. Um, one I think you'll appreciate, which is a, a comment about um, you know, voluntary self-disclosures and that there has been a slowdown in the past few years of review. So the, the comment is you know, welcoming the streamlining and, and expeditious review of, of, of the, the voluntary self-disclosures. 
Another another uh, question that we have, and you know, I don't know how much you're going to be able to speak to this, but maybe as uh, the question is about the foreign direct product rule and any expansion of that going forward, and you know, without getting ahead of you know any announcements or any other thinking, maybe you could at least you know provide some of your insights on. What is the foreign direct product rule? It's been in the news a lot lately. It's not, you know, super intuitive. So uh, if you could lay that out and, you know, provide any insights that you have on that question, that would be great. Sure. So um, I, I, with the caveat that I'm happy to talk about sort of how the foreign direct pro foreign direct product rule sort of works generally, how it's worked um, with Huawei, which is where it's in place at the moment. Um, but my comments will be limited to that. Um, but, um, sorry, as, as a general as a general matter, um, I think the best way to think about it is um, ordinarily our export uh, controls, most of our export controls apply to US origin goods, things that were sort of made, manufactured in the United States. The foreign direct product rule extends our um, export controls to things that are made and manufactured outside of the United States but that are made with technology that is US origin. So in other words, something can be manufactured somewhere else in the world, but if it's made on a machine that has, um, uh, you know, uh, a particular um, US technology in it, that that's that US technology that allows that machine to make the thing, the foreign direct product rule reaches that as well and means that you need to comply with our export control rules and regulations and would need a license or whatever else is required. Um, it's the same as if that good had been shipped out of the United States. I hope that was clear. I know it's a little complicated, but I think like trying to boil it down into plain English, yeah. that's how the foreign direct product rule works. I mean, it's it's pretty ex it's pretty expansive. And do you know? Do do any of our partners have similar types of of, of uh, laws and regulations? Uh, it's a good question. I don't actually know the answer. Week seven, only week seven. So uh, hey, we'll, we'll uh, <laughs> we 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 will uh, we will get to that answer, and and maybe we'll have to do another another conversation. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure there is an answer. I but I don't. I don't know if other if other um, countries also have similar sort of foreign direct product rules um, or not. The, I, my my belief is the only time it's been used um, to date is is um, with regard to Huawei. So it's it's not something that we we use every day. Sure. No. Under understood. Um, well, we are just about at time. Um, I wanted to give you um, a minute or two if there's any last remarks that you want to make, Matt. This has been incredibly um, constructive conversation. I think we've given industry colleagues a lot to chew on and think about. Um, I know that you are, you know, you've got a lot on your plate today, especially uh, is, a, is a day where, where all of us are going to be watching the news, I'm sure, quite closely. Um, so I just want to thank you from Silverado and, you know, offer you the chance to make any closing remarks. Oh, thanks, Sarah. And thanks so much to Silverado for hosting me today. I've really enjoyed our, our conversation. Um, I, yeah, I guess in closing, I would, I would just say that um, I think that the role of export controls and export enforcement are um, only becoming more and more sort of important as a national security tool. Um, if you think about sort of big picture, um, the, the way um, things are trending, and you go back to our conversation about the sort of the rise of the threat from state actors, um, you know, hopefully, I'll not, you know, knock on wood here, right? Like, we, we, we don't find ourselves in, um, Sort of military conflict with with state actors um, very often, um, but but there are these sort of um, things that um, uh, I don't know the right word for it, but um, uh, that state actors are sort of engaging in struggles back and forth, and this this is one of them, right? The cyber front is a, is another, and how um, you know the the sort of cyber challenges we've we faced from from countries like North Korea and and, and Russia. 
and China. Um, but I, I think that our, um, given sort of the state of the world and the nature of the threats we, we face, I do think that um, export controls and export enforcement are a critical piece of the, of the national security um, effort that, um, that the US government is bringing to bear to, in order to keep, keep our country safe, not just in the short term, in the long term. And it's one of the reasons I'm so proud to um, be here with the dedicated um, men and women of the Bureau of Industry and Security who you know, have been doing this every day for, for years and will continue to do it. Um, and uh, as I said, I think you know, that's their, their profile is, is gonna continue to grow. Um, they, they've been doing it um, all along. And uh, I think I'm just really lucky to be here and, and excited to be a part of it. Well, I, I, I couldn't agree more. And uh, in closing, just want to thank you for your leadership. We are going to be, you know, watching all of these initiatives and, and following all the work that you're doing closely. And uh, just really thank you for your time and your public service. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody.